Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Eva Lainala from the OECD Secretariat, and I'd like to thank you uh, for joining today's webinar. Uh, we'll, we'll be discussing um, a recently released guidance document on uh, reconciling terminology for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, so just a little bit about uh, the global PFC group from where this work um, uh, derives. So the global PFC group was created to support um, the uh, strategic approach to international chemicals management and resolutions created under SICM uh, to shift to safer alternatives for PFAS chemicals. So the, the Global PFC group is a broad group. It contains representatives from countries, from academia, from NGOs, and from industry stakeholders. And the OECD has been providing uh, the secretariat uh, for uh, the initiative of the Global PFC group. So much of what the Global PFC group uh, does is about uh, sharing and dissemination of information on risk management approaches to PFAS. Uh, particularly within uh, various countries, uh, but also the development of technical publications uh, for those that are working uh, in the area uh, of risk management of PFAS. So we're, uh, 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 we're, we'd like to welcome today uh, Zen Yun Wang from ETH Zurich. Uh, he led the writing group uh, for this uh, terminology document, which consisted of a number of members of the global PFAS group. And this was also done with the support of the uh, Swiss government, which is much appreciated. So Zen Yun will walk us through um, some of the highlights um, of uh, the recommendations uh, of, the, of the guidance. Um, I just want to point out that uh, in this um, Zoom uh, environment, there is uh, in this uh, sort of webinar environment, you'll have a button for Q&A um, and there's also the chat function, uh, but we'd like you to enter uh, your questions I just go to the next slide, actually, it says this. If you could uh, enter your questions um, in the Q&A function, and we'll take up as many of those questions um, after Zenyun's presentation. Um, if you, it's more about of a technical issue, you could put that uh, in the chat. Um, also, uh, I'd like to note that this webinar is being recorded, and the um, portion of Zenyun's presentation itself, uh, but not the Q&A, will be made uh, public afterwards on our uh, PFAS website and the uh, OECD YouTube uh, channel. Also, um, before I turn things over to Zen Yun, just want to flag that um, as you'll be exiting the webinar at the end, we will, there'll be a little bit of a survey that pops up. And uh, we'd appreciate if you take a couple of moments to fill that out, and particularly uh, the question on um, topics for future webinars that the Global PFC group could put forward, and that'd be very helpful uh, for discussions on, on topics to address uh, in webinars. So at this point, I will stop sharing my screen and, and ask uh, Yuzanian to share your screen. Yeah, thank you, Eva, for the introduction. I hope you all can see my screen now. Yes, perfectly, thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, many thanks again for, for the opportunity to present the, the, the recent report on reconciling terminology of the universe of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS. So, yeah, um, as Eva said, that we also re uh, really like to acknowledge that it is, uh, this is really a joint effort a multi -stakeholder, uh, by multi-stakeholders under the uh, OECD UNEP Global PFC Group. Um, yeah, the work was conducted between uh, June 2018 and March this year. Uh, we also very much like to acknowledge my uh, the co uh, like co-writing <laughs> the team members from the writing team. Uh, yeah, from the industry, academia, and also uh, regulators from all of the world. Uh, I also put a link here on the slide uh, where you can download the full reports. And of course, it is also provided in the chat. So, so I yeah. 
uh, what I'd like to uh, guide you through quickly, uh, give you some overview about uh, the four major parts in, uh, included in these reports. So the, uh, the first is the PFAS definition and the universe. Second is practical guidance on how to use the PFAS terminology. Third part is systematic characterization and the categorization of PFAS. And the fourth part is about the future areas of work. For today's presentation, I will focus on the first two parts as they are most relevant for uh, probably everyone here. Uh, and the, the last two parts are a bit more technical and uh, yeah, we can find all the details give you a quick overview and you can find all the other details in the reports. So maybe I just also take one step back why we initiated such a work under the OECD UNEP Global PFC Group. So uh, as, as probably everyone knows that there have been so many happening in the field of PFAS uh, within the last 20, uh, 20 years. And I want to particularly capture like three moments in these 20 years, which has inspired uh, the, the, uh, inspired the motivation to initiate this work. So I think the first important moment was uh, like in the early 2000s when like P, um, perfluorocotonic acid, PFOA, and the perfluorocotane sulfonic acid, P4, started to attract much public attention because their hazards and also the ubiquitous presence in the environment, global environment. Uh, and later on, the work has also been expanded from these two PFAS to a wider range of substances. Uh, and during the beginning of this uh, time, it is noticed that different terms like pre- and polyfluorinated chemicals are highly fluorinated compounds, uh, and perfluorinated organics were used. So there were many very different terms. Uh, people used very different languages. Um, not, and until like 2011, when Bakaita published a milestone paper on our first comprehensive overview of PFAS detected uh, in the environment, wildlife, um, and humans. And also very important to point out that Bakaita paper also point, uh, provided a first clear structural definition of PFAS. Then we heard all the time a little bit further. Uh, so like in 2018, the OECD UNEP Global PFC Group published a new list of over 4,700 PFASs, including ones that contain perfluorinated carbon moieties, but do not meet the definition in bucket paper due to a lack of a CF3 group at the end of the molecule. So uh, it is kind of like um, with, with the publish of the, the OECD 2018 PFAS list, uh, we were thinking that maybe it is time to take a refresh look at the PFAS definition uh, and terminology. So that's how everything started. Um, and then, yeah, I'll quickly guide you go through the main uh, major uh, highlights of the reports. First is with the PFAS definition and universe. So, um, so we first, before getting to the PFAS definition, we first look into the limitations of uh, the previous PFAS definition. Uh, and we identified the four uh, major limitations. Of course, there could be some others. Um, it could be, uh, yeah, with the understanding of the PFAS universe uh, through like more data reporting uh, by industry or uh, the non-targeted screening, we may uh, learn about many uh, new type of PFAS, which may not be, um, yeah, which may uh, ask us late, uh, in a later time to further review the, the definition. But at the moment, we identify these four major cases. First, the first one is that the fully fluorinated uh, saturated carbon moiety is connected with functional groups on both ends, uh, including having a single hydrogen bromine and chlorine atom on one end. So I give, uh, the, here also show you some examples on the most left is the well-known PFOA molecules, 
and the middle one is perfluoral alkylic carboxylic acids with carboxylic acid group on both ends of the functional group. And then there's also uh, one uh, hydrogen substituted PFOA, like with one hydrogen atom on the one end of the molecule and on with the carboxylic group on the other end of the molecule. So this uh, constitutes the first case. Uh, the second case is that the substance is a fully fluorinated aliphatic cyclic compound, which may or may not have a fully fluorinated LQ side chain. So here's also a very well-known example of p force, And then in the middle is a, a, a cyclic isomer of the p force with a cyclic ring in the middle of the, yeah, on the fluorinated chain side. Uh, and then on the most right, this, uh, it's also the homolog of the middle one uh, without the fluorinated uh, side chain. Um, the third example is, uh, the third case is the uh, functional group contains an aromatic ring somewhere. somewhere. So uh, also have some examples, like uh, on the left side as well, no examples of the 622 fluoro telomere alcohol, FTOH. And on the right side, there's another uh, 622 fluoro telomere based substance with a benzene ring in the middle of the functional group. Uh, and this, uh, the aromatic ring may cut off during the degradation phase and still act as a, a, a precursor to perfluorohexonic acid, PFHXA. Um, and the last case is the description in the previous de um, definition, like highly fluorinated is, uh, is ambiguous uh, and cannot be literally translated to fluorine mass percentage within the molecule. Here are also some examples to show that this fluorine mass really depends on the, also <laughs> depends on the, uh, the, the size of the functional groups. And in some cases, the functional groups can be really long, uh, big, and then the fluorine mass really uh, depends. Uh, but what's important to notice is that all, all of these compounds with different fluorine mass percentage, they all uh, may act as precursors to PFHXA. So, so we identified these four cases uh, and then uh, in order to address them, uh, so we proposed the revised PFAS definition and the new definition reads, uh, PFAS are defined as fluorinated substances that contain at least one flu fully fluorinated May2 or May2 link carbon atom without any hydrogen, chlorine, bromine, and iodine atom attached to it. Um, and the second part of the uh, definition is just basically repeating the first part, but just writing a slightly different way uh, on the request by several stakeholders, just to make sure that the, uh, the definition is communicated in a clear way. So the rationale to, ha uh, to have such is to have a general PFAS definition that is coherent and consistent from the chemical structure point of view uh, and is in easily implementable by non-experts. Um, I also like to <laughs> hear also a little bit of the technical detail is that uh, the perfluorinated M2 and M2 link groups are uh, saturated uh, and aliphatic. So this part is consistent with the previous definition I also like to point out uh, it's a very technical detail is that there's also other ways to write um, the perfluorinated methylene group. Uh, so yeah, but uh, it's still the perfluorinated methylene group. Um, and also during the preparation of the report, there has been also the questions uh, about why we specify the fluorinated methylene and the or methylene group, it is because uh, it is to uh, explicitly exclude substance with a, a perfluorinated methane group. So this is a, 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 
carbon atom with one fluorine on it, and then it's either connected to other carbon atoms or hetero atoms uh, other than hydrogen, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So um, yeah, with this new uh, revised PFAS definition, I would also like to show you some examples to illustrate what does that mean. So I kind of show, uh, uh, yeah, we made some figures to illustrate that uh, there's this uh, PFAS that already meets, uh, here are the examples of PFAS that already meet the definition by bucket. Huh? So there's uh, some very no well-known examples like uh, P-force, uh, perfluorhexane, perfluoromethane, uh, hydrofluoropropylene, uh, uh, FO1234ZE, uh, polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE, uh, perfluoropolyesis, and cytochrome fluoronated polymers. So they were already um, they already meet the definition by bucket R. And with um, this revised definition, uh, there are several uh, groups of PFAS also added. One is this the cyclic PFAS. Uh, without uh, the LQ chain. So one example is here. And then the, there's also two examples on the right side showing that they also uh, have uh, the molecule has functional groups on both ends of the floor, fully fluorinated uh, carbon chain. And then there are some examples to show you that they also include uh, um, uh, fluorinated uh, the, the, the substances with a uh, aromatic ring somewhere in the functional group. So the, um, and then we also like to highlight there are also other substance, fluorinated substances, but, but they are not PFAS according to this revised PFAS definition. So what, for example, like this uh, fluorinated aromatics, uh, without uh, fluorinated side chains. And also uh, many different substances, they're not uh, recognized as fully fluorinated substances because they have a hydrogen or, or chlorine, bromine, iodine on the molecules. Uh, and also on the bottom, you can see that this, um, the substances with, with only like, uh, uh, unsaturated uh, floor, uh, carbon fluoro chain so that they don't have fully, uh, yeah, made to, uh, fully fluorinated made to or made to link group in a molecule. So this is what I uh, hope, hope to give you a good uh, overview about uh, which compounds would be regarded as PFAS according to this revised PFAS definition and which ones are not. Um, and our, our report also further looking to how does the PFAS embedded uh, in organofluorine compounds because organofluorine compounds is a very, very big uh, class of uh, chemicals. And uh, so we'll have these figures here to show you that like this, uh, the, the middle three ones are defined as PFAS, while we have also other fluorinated aliphatic substances that do not have a fully fluorinated methyl or methylene carbon atoms as also shown before. So this, those are not, those are not re uh, regarded as PFAS. And then we also have these fluorinated aromatic substances but without um, yeah, the side chain uh, that would meet the PFAS definition. So you can also check uh, these examples in the reports uh, later on for more details. Uh, and then uh, the, the report also provide a little bit more uh, figure illustration about the PFAS universe. For example, the, here's a figure about uh, the major groups of PFAS. Uh, of course, <laughs> it's not readable here, but uh, yeah, all the details are provided in the reports and it's a PDF file, so we can really expand the figure to, to see all the details. Same wise, uh, it's also we have prov provided also, this is a map 
of how PFAS are synthesized or reported uh, in the different uh, public literature, which you can also find or can also uh, expand and also see all the details in the reports. So this is more or less the first part, what you can expect it from the report about the PFAS definition and the PFAS universe. And then the second part is about uh, the practical guidance on how to use the PFAS terminology. So one important aspect is like the, we recommend to distinguish uh, between the PFAS definition versus user specific working scopes. Uh, so this is because, um, so, so as said before, the PFAS definition is based on chemical structure. It does not any, include any, uh, any minimal or maximal chain length requirements or any other considerations beyond chemistry. The goal is to, to, to uh, the rationale is to make it easily implementable uh, by all uh, uh, yeah, stakeholders, including non-experts. Of course, the, 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 some might, may view uh, this general definition of PFAS may be too broad, uh, encompassing thousands of more compounds for anyone to address at once. Uh, but I just would like to highlight, it serves as a, a good starting point uh, and a reference point to guide the individual users to have a comprehensive understanding of the PFAS universe uh, and then to keep the big picture of the PFAS universe in mind. Um, at the same time, uh, individual users actually can or define their own working scopes based on uh, for certain activities uh, according to their specific needs. Uh, yeah, by combining the general PFAS definition with additional considerations. So for example, here are also some examples to show that our different organizations, their different reports have used the different uh, working scopes on PFAS. So this report does not recommend make any recommendations on how a working scope should be set up. Uh, also regarding regarding with uh, factors to consider because this is really depends on the local uh, specific context. However, this report does highly recommend that users clearly provide the context and the rationale for selecting their PFAS working scope. So, so yeah, such kind of clear communication can help to can provide the transparency and avoid confusion by the others. So this is the first important aspect that uh, the report would like to bring really to distinct between the general PFAS definition and user specific uh, PFAS working scopes. The second aspect is how to identify and use suitable PFAS terms. So uh, yeah, there's so many different compounds with different properties. So it is really strongly recommended that PFAS terminology should be used in a clear, specific and descriptive manner. Uh, this is because more general terms can be ambiguous and sometimes inaccurate. So here's an example saying that PFAS are surfactants. So this is factually inaccurate. Not all PFASs are used as surfactants. So, so that's why we would suggest that the report also recommends that when drafting a statement, please do ask yourself the following two questions. Am I referring to all PFAS or not? If not, which terms would most clearly describe the substance that my statement is referring to? The report also provides some sorts of guidance on how to do that. Uh, and we will also show you uh, in the next slide. Before going to the next slide, we'll also like to point out that the report also gives some uh, recommendations how to uh, about like how the individual PFAS need to be uh, named in a clear, specific and descriptive manner in terms of how to uh, use the acronyms. And when you use acronyms, uh, please do provide the full name, other identifiers like class numbers, structural formulas, etc., so that people can uh, identify the substances like unambiguously. 
Um, and then uh, coming back to the point is how to locate uh, suitable PFAS terms. So, uh, so we define, uh, kind of develop these five level descriptors that you may consider to use. So for each level, it has the different uh, specificity with the level one on top, most general, and down the level five on bottom being most specific. So you can either go either direction. So you can start with uh, test with your uh, the most general ones and uh, whether it matches your statement or uh, going down. And then if it's too general, then you can go down to more specific ones or you can uh, start from the bottom and uh, moving up, like how generalization is suitable. So here's also, we also give some examples, for example, like the level one, it's really about when you use PFAS terms. Uh, and then you, when you go down, it's like, uh, uh, am I discussing uh, floral polymers? Or am I discussing all floral polymers or just the PTFE? Uh, and also among the PTFE, am I discussing all the PTFE or this non-functionalized PTFE? Or am I discussing the non-functionalized PTFE? or non-functionalized PTFE or very specific PTFE products. So this is a good way just to consider uh, like to locate the proper PFAS terms for use in, in your work. Um, so, these are, so these two are the major ones that I would like to highlight. And then I want to give you a very brief overview about this systematic a characterization and the categorization of PFAS as previously said that user can define their own working scope of PFAS. So it will also be important to know which PFAS are, are within their working scope. And sometimes it can be challenging, especially for non-chemists or non-experts. So the report um, proposed a standardized system for um, kind of systematically characterizing PFAS based on the molecular structure traits. So you basically break the molecule into a very basic descriptors based on the molecular structure. And then you can use the different combinations of the descriptors to like to identify the substances within your uh, PFAS working scope, for example. Um, and uh, such descriptors may be developed into automated chem informatic tools um, so that uh, like it can help people to really to uh, digest, um, digest the molecular structure and uh, like, yeah, highlight whether the substance is in uh, the scope or not. So, so basically we divided the PFAS molecule into the two structural parts, looking to the first on the, looking to the fluorinated carbon chain, uh, we call it uh, like part A, and you can look into our, whether it's a RQ chain or it's RQ ether chain, whether it's perfluorinated or polyfluorinated, whether it's uh, linear versus branch versus cyclic isomers, or whether it's saturated chain, whether it's non-saturated chain, whether it's polymeric or non-polymeric and the different chain lenses. And then the second part is the functional group B. Uh, you can look into uh, the different types and structures of functional groups, so whether it's polymeric and non-polymeric. And uh, there's also the third one we introduce is to combine the two parts and uh, more specifically about how they are combined. For example, there's one fluorinated common chain linked to a zero, a one, or two functional groups. So this can help you to pass the molecular structure uh, and then into the different descriptors. Here's also kind of in the report, we prov provide a number of the examples how, how can, you can pass uh, the molecules, for example, uh, like you can also define the PFOA precursors using these the basic uh, descriptors. And then these things can later on perhaps be translated or with the help from the chemical informaticians to translate it into automated tools to help users to digest the molecular structure. So you can find all the details in the reports. 
the last part of the report is about uh, highlights several areas for future work. One area is, uh, yeah, there could be a centralized PFAS nomenclature database or platform, uh, because it's also, uh, you may be aware that there are more and more this non-target screening these days, and they will identify a lot of different uh, new structures that do not have a common name. It does not make sense to, like everyone creates its own name, then it makes the data compilation, it's really challenging across studies. So it, such a uh, centralized PFAS nomenclature database uh, could be really helpful. Uh, the second is, uh, as I said before, that uh, for the systematic characterization uh, and categorization of PFAS, uh, yeah, this automated chemical informatic tools will be very helpful. Uh, the third is what I would like to highlight is that there will also need some work on the characterization and the reporting of polymers. Uh, as also the example previously shown that even a polymer is called, uh, like if even different polymers are, are under the same umbrella of PTFE, there could still be very different polymer products with different chain lengths, uh, with different functional groups on the end, so with different um, uh, impurities levels, etc. So it will be good to further look into the characterization and the reporting of the polymers to have such information in the public domain. Uh, the last thing is, as also before shown, that there are also many other organofluorine compounds other than PFAS, and this report uh, specifically looking to the PFAS, and the future work may also look into other organofluorine compounds. So I think this, hope this is a rather brief presentation, hope it can give you a good overview about what uh, this report entails. Uh, and the report contains a number of the details uh, and also quite some footnotes to help you to really understand the different parts of the report. Um, yeah, of course, if you have any questions, uh, happy to answer uh, during the Q&A also later on. Um, and also, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention and uh, yeah, feedback is uh, most welcome. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zen Yun. So um, get, I'd like to end today's uh, uh, webinar. So the, the webinar, the recording and the presentation will be available on our website, um, the OECD um, YouTube channel, but also through our OECD PFAS uh, website uh, in the next couple of days. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, as you exit the survey, as, sorry, as you exit the webinar, there'll be a really brief survey. If you have ideas for future webinars, we'd be most um, appreciative to have some uh, topics that um, you know people would be hearing, uh, like to be hearing about. And uh, final thank you to Zen Yun um, uh, for leading the drafting group and then also the drafting group. There's a number of you as attendees here. So I also thank you for all of your support uh, in uh, putting together uh, this, this document and to the members of the Global PF, uh, PFAS PFC group um, for also the, the review and, and contributions. Um, so we hope it'll be a, a useful resource uh, for you um, moving forward. So thanks everyone and have a good day. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Eva. Thanks. <laughs>